is Raina Campbell, your chief dream driver, and welcome to the No Parking Podcast, where through conversations and discussions with creators like yourself, we'll find interesting approaches to help you take your dreams out of park, put them in drive, and ride towards success. There's someone out there waiting to hear your voice right now. They can't hear it from Oprah. They can't hear it from Tony Robbins. They can't hear it from Rihanna. They can't hear it from Beyonce. They got to hear it from you. They're waiting to hear it from you, but until you start speaking, they will never hear it. Hey, Dream Drivers. Welcome to episode 72 of the Dreams and Drive podcast. And that voice that you heard is our guest for today, Dre Baldwin. Now, Dre is a work on your game expert. He also teaches mental toughness, self-confidence and self-discipline to athletes, entrepreneurs and business professionals. I had Dre on the show today because his platform is really about how to uh, fight fear and how to fight doubt and how to really develop this mental toughness and the topic of fear, fear of failure, overcoming that fear of failure and even the fear of success is something that you all mentioned you would love us to really uh, hone in on the show. So I thought Dre was going to be a perfect person to come in and talk about that. Some of the other things that we discuss in this episode is how you can stay focused despite setbacks how to know what you should be focusing on in life, how to provide value that makes you stand out, you know, how to stop letting fear and doubt get in the way. And Dre also gives his three-step process for instilling confidence and motivating yourself. So you guys get your notebooks out. This is going to be um, a podcast full of questions that you'll need to ask yourself. And if you want today's show notes, just go to dreamsanddrive.com and click on episode 72 for all the tweetables from today's episode. We also have a freebie that you can download, and that's going to be the list of quotes and questions that you want to ask yourself that will help you um, overcome your fear of failure, be more confident, and develop mental toughness. And a quick way to get that would be just to go to dreamsanddrive.com slash free. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash free. And before we get into today's episode, I just want to give a quick shout out to everyone who has filled out the Dreams and Drive listener survey. I really appreciate it. It has been such um, so valuable going through it and seeing how you guys are responding to the show, some of the things that you're you're being challenged with and ways that we can provide more value to you all so if you haven't filled out the survey yet go to dreamsanddrive.com slash survey and I'm going to be um giving away five gift cards once the survey closes which that which will be on April 15th so make sure that you definitely fill that out before then so one last thing is if you haven't already make sure that you are following us on social at dreams and drive and make sure to use the hashtag dreams and drive when you're talking about the show there's going to be a lot of tweetables from today's episode so I want to make sure that your audience knows how to interact with other dream drivers so use that hashtag dreams and drive and make sure to follow us I'll be looking for the shout outs for this episode so please 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 make sure to do so All right, guys, I hope that you guys enjoy and uh, we'll chat later at the outro. Hi, Dre. Thank you so much for being a guest on today's episode of Dreams in Drive. Absolutely, Raina. I'm very excited to be here. I'm excited to have you on as we were talking before, you know, it's been a while. This has been in the making as kind of seems like that happens with a lot of guests that I want to have on the show. Just have to wait till the timing is perfect, but we're making it happen now. So that's what I am excited about. Absolutely. Me as well. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I love to start all our podcast interview off is with the question, what inspired you as a child? I sometimes think it's really important to go all the way back when thinking about our dream driving journeys. Like how did that, how did those early years, the young Dre, what did he look like? What did he do? What were his dreams? What inspired me was that I knew I wanted to do something where people would know my name, something that where I could feel like I was significant and where I felt like I could, my presence mattered, where my presence mattered, where I, if I did something, people knew about it. And if I wasn't there, people would be wondering, where is he at? What did, what did he do? Where did he go? Why isn't he here? That's what inspired me as a child. Really? Like you were, you were like eight years old with that, with that thinking? Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm just saying that because I feel like, you know, when I was eight years old, I had it. I don't I don't think I would have been able to articulate articulate it like that. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I probably wouldn't have either, but now. (laughs) (laughs) Did you have, um, like, what did people, do you remember, like, what your teachers would say about you, what your parents or siblings or friends would say about you as a youngster? Yeah, as a youngster, I was definitely more shy in a lot of situations. When I turned, when I was around five years old, my mother noticed that I had some type of vision affliction, so I went and got glasses. And this is back before it was cool to wear glasses. We're talking about the 80s. Mm-hmm. It was cool to wear glasses. And I don't know if the listeners remember, but there used to be this TV show in the 90s called Family Matters. And there was this character called Steve Urkel. You yes, remember? Steve Urkel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so people would call me Urkel because I had these thick bifocal glasses. Kids would laugh at me. I wasn't even thinking twice about talking to any girls. So I was like a nerd, a geek, back before it was cool to be a nerd or a geek. This is when you know, being on the internet and stuff like that, there was not a lot of business opportunity in that. It was you playing sports, maybe you were in the streets doing something, but it wasn't anything with you know being smart or being very intelligent or being the type of kid that I was. So I was shy in that way. I was I would get laughed at sometimes by the other kids. I wasn't good at playing sports or anything like that. I don't think I was really cool with the cool kids. I didn't talk to the girls, at least not the ones I was attracted to. So that's what people would say about me when I was young. I don't know if they had any idea I would become who I am now. So um, where did you grow up again? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay, okay, okay. So you were young. You were growing up in Philly. And um, how did that... How did you change as you grew older and how did your dreams and aspirations change if they did or not? Well, I always knew I wanted to play sports because I've been playing sports, been very physically active since a young child. And coming up in the city, people know you playing kickball in the driveway, maybe basketball in somebody's backyard court, two hand touch football in the street. So I was always playing sports and I thought I would make it in. My first sport that I loved was football. I thought I would make it in football, but my family couldn't really afford the equipment necessary to play tackle football. So then I moved on to baseball because my favorite athlete growing up was this guy named Deion Sanders. Mm-hmm. And everybody, Deion, he played football and baseball, NFL and Major League Baseball. So I figured, okay, I could be Deion in one of these sports. I wasn't too good at baseball. So by age 14, after I had played baseball for a couple of years and realized I didn't have any real talent for baseball, I moved on to basketball, which was the thing that most of the kids in my neighborhood did. I was terrible at first. Eventually, I started to build my skills up just through discipline, hard work, just being mentally tough enough to know that if I keep showing up more often than everyone else, I'm going to eventually catch up to them. That, at least that was my theory. It sounds good in retrospect. That was my theory, but it hadn't been proven. There wasn't anybody on the internet telling me, hey, this is going to work. I just had to try it. So as my game started to develop being an athlete, that's when I started to think to myself around maybe age 16 or 17, I'm going to become a pro in basketball. And I knew a lot of people were going to know my name and I figured it was going to be through playing basketball. And it was through basketball, but it wasn't in the way that I thought it would be. But that just goes along to show you how things work with a vision. The Mm -hmm. more clear you are with the vision, the closer you're going to get to exactly what you want. Because as I said at the beginning, my vision was always people are going to know my name. And then it became people are going to know my name through basketball. And people did come to know my name through basketball. But listen, that in 1992, you didn't know YouTube was coming 15 years later. But I ended up getting known through basketball on YouTube a lot more than I did through my professional career because most people have no idea how basketball works outside of the NBA in the United States. So even though I was playing in those places, that gives me credibility with people who understand. Most people who know me know me because of what I did on YouTube. But it was getting known through basketball, just like my vision was. All right, so let's let's go back. So I think you mentioned something really important is that you realized you didn't have talent in baseball, so you decided to move on, right? right. How do you hone in on figuring out what your talent is and maybe we can tie that into maybe figuring out if you need to move on to the next dream you know what i mean absolutely yes that's, that's an excellent question and people ask me that often how do you know when you've gone far enough in something that you need to say you know what this is not going to work let me just move on to something different or when is it as opposed to when you're trying something that you really are into you're not getting a result yet but you should just keep going. You shouldn't just quit and give up because people, there's this really negative stigma attached to quitting and giving up on things. So when do you give up? And I say a number, the number one way that you know when it's time to keep going versus when it's time to quit is how excited are you 
compared to how far you are from the goal. How excited are you to show up and keep doing the work? When I had terrible games in baseball or even basketball when I first began, the question I had to ask myself is how excited am I to go out there tomorrow for the next baseball practice or to come to the court again to work on my game in basketball? And I wasn't that excited about baseball. I was kind of just doing it, going through the motions because my friends were playing baseball. Another question you can ask yourself is when it's not working, do you feel like or is your mind still racing with different ways to figure out how to make it work? Or are you just bogged down and, okay, this is not working, so I'm going to just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again because I guess that's just how life is supposed to be. I guess I'm just supposed to be stuck in the struggle. Are you still thinking of different ways to figure it out, or are you just resigning yourself to the reality, the current reality, and just saying, okay, I guess this is just what my life is going to be? So those are two questions I think anyone should ask themselves if you're in a situation where it's not quite working yet. And you're questioning whether or not you should keep going or you should give it up and go find something else to do. Do you think that people ever waste their talents? Absolutely. People waste their talents all the time. And I'm going to give you a couple different ways people waste their talent. One Mm -hmm. way is that people never even ask themselves, what is my talent? What is my special gift that I bring to this planet? Because every human being, Raina, has a special gift. But many people go through their entire lives, they never even ask themselves, what is the special gift I bring to this world and how can I get it out there? They never ask that question. It is a very simple question. Many people never ask it. So that's one way that people waste their talent. Another way is that someone may ask that question or they may just know without even asking. Maybe they're just blessed to somehow, some way get put into a position to know what their talent is from a young age or something happens where they know their talent, but for whatever reason, they decide to run away from that talent. Maybe they know that they're really good at singing, but they had some bad experience trying to get a record deal, so they just decide they're never going to try to sing again because of the the scars from that situation. Or maybe they have people who have tried to push them into doing it, maybe push them too hard, push them before they were ready, or they got into some type of traumatic situation, maybe other people with more talent than them, so they gave up on themselves. So they just they are actively staying away from their talent. And another thing that can happen is people identify their talent, they start working on it, maybe start to get some success, but it's not happening fast enough compared to maybe what the expectations are, expectations of other people, expectations of themselves. And eventually they either settle into a rut of mediocrity with their talent or they just completely give up on it again. And those are a lot of see, those are a lot of good things that we need to ask ourselves, because I think a lot of people listening in may be sitting on a talent and may be too scared to move forward. I think that's also the next step. Right. Knowing you have this talent, but being fearful. But before we get to that, Dre, I want to get back to your story and kind of talk about how you got discovered through YouTube. So talk us through how YouTube helped you grow the foundation for your online brand. Well, I would say is kind of like the other way around, Raina. I oh, okay. actually kind of I kind of discovered YouTube. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Tell us that story. <laughs> I helped build the brand of what people are doing on YouTube these days because what actually happened is kind of two parallel stories happening at once. When I graduated from college, I wanted to become a professional basketball player, but I didn't have a a very solid resume from college. No one was going to sign me to a pro basketball contract based on my resume up until that point. So I knew I needed to do something to get myself seen more playing even better than I had played for the previous 18, not 18, 22 years. So I went to what is called an exposure camp. And for those who don't know what an exposure camp is, it's similar to a job fair. But instead of putting on a suit and handing out your resume, you put on your sport gear, whatever sport this is, and you play your sport in front of other people. And you play your sport against and with other people who are also trying to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. So imagine you're walking into a gym. There are 200 guys in there. All of them have played college ball, most of them. Everybody wants to play professional basketball. Maybe out of 200 people in there, maybe 20 of them will go on to play pro. And that's only because we got all these people concentrated in one place whose stated goal is to play pro. So that's a very high percentage, 20 out of 200, for those who don't know. But in the audience watching... You have all the power brokers in the business. You have the coaches. You have the agents. You have the managers. You have the scouts. You have the talent evaluators who are going to write a scouting report on you. They're all watching. I played pretty good at that camp. And the video from that camp, if anyone remembers this, this is back in 2005. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a MP4 file on a USB stick. It was a VHS tape. Oh, my People, gosh. That <laughs> is so old school. <laughs> <laughs> so the video was on a VHS tape. And I looked at that tape and I said, "Okay, I'm going to need this tape to get my career going. I'm going to want this tape because this is 
like the most important basketball I've ever played in my life at this point. I went and got that transfer to a CD, put the CD in my parents' desktop computer, and put that video, and this is spring of 2006 when I actually put this on, this brand new video website called YouTube.com. Now, when I put that video on YouTube, I was only putting it there for myself, just so I could share it with other people if I needed to talk to an agent or try to communicate with some team in Europe, and they asked to see a video of me, I could send them a link instead of having to physically mail a copy of a VHS tape, which is what I had been doing up to that point. But it come, I come to find out a couple months later, I just went to check on the video, make sure it's still there, and people had left comments on the video. And I know I didn't know these people. I know these people didn't know me. And I'm like, why, wow. why are people leaving comments? They don't know me. I, hadn't, I haven't played a second of pro basketball. My college career was nothing spectacular. But they were watching the video and asking questions like, hey, who taught you how to play? Hey, where do you play? How often do you practice? How do you work on jumping hard? Do you know drills for vertical jumps so I can learn how to dunk? What about dribbling? Do you do drills for dribbling? How'd you get so good at it? So I realized when I saw people asking those questions, this is an underserved market. There are a bunch of kids out there who are just like me, who are 14, 15, 18, 25, 35 years old, who want to learn how to play basketball for whatever reason, yet they don't have a coach. They don't have a parent who plays a sport. They don't have a brother or sister playing a sport. They're looking for ways to learn how to play the sport. So basically what I started doing is taking my camera to the gym, and this is a little cheap $100 camera back when we used to have actual digital cameras, not not video cameras, but cameras where we took pictures before the smartphone. Yeah, yeah so I had me a camera with a little USB stick so I could record video, and I would just record myself working out every day, put those videos up on YouTube. These are literal home videos, and that was the beginning of my YouTube channel, and I was the first athlete in any sport, male or female, posting video training content on the internet for free. So I started that whole platform. So now when you look at YouTube or Instagram and you see people just working out and that's their whole thing, they're just working out. Not about to play in a game, not about to go to the Olympics. They're just working out and putting the video up and building the entire brand around it. That didn't exist until 2006 when I first started doing it. So that's how I got quote unquote discovered on YouTube. So so Dre, you are a you describe yourself as someone who teaches mental toughness, self confidence, and self discipline to athletes, entrepreneurs, and business professionals. During the time when you started seeing success via YouTube, is this when you started seeing that you could brand yourself as a as an influencer and as a thought leader in this realm? Like, were you thinking about how you could turn this uh, I wanna say hobby or passion of yours into an actual business? Well, what happened is actually is two different things to that. Number okay. one, when it comes to answer your second question, the reason I started even building building up what at first was my just my website and putting more attention on YouTube and posting the video every single day to the point I have over 5,000 of them now was that in my professional basketball career, because we had these two parallel stories going, I was having it was up and down my career. So it wasn't like I signed my first contract and as soon as that one ended, I signed another one. Then that ended and I signed another one. It wasn't like that. There were years where I didn't know when my next contract was going to be. There were months into the season and I was still home in the United States wondering, like, when am I going to get a deal where I'm sending out hundreds of emails over courses of months just to make just to make an opportunity for myself. I did that several times. Mm -hmm. So there was a point where I looked at the situation and I remember I mean, several people have used this phrase, but they say, if you want to know what your future is, all you need to do is look at your current situation and project it out five years, 10 years, 20 years. And do you want your life to be like this in five years? And I was looking at my situation. I said, no, I'm, I'm a pro basketball player, which is what I always wanted to do. But I have no control. I don't always know when my next contract's coming, meaning I don't know when next time I'm going to get paid is, even though I love basketball. So I asked myself a really, really good question. And this was the question. Mm -hmm. How can I take what I love doing, which is playing basketball, and I also loved being on the internet because I had a, a little blog going at the time, which became DreAllDay.com. How can I combine those two things together and start to make money from it, make a business out of this? And at that time, this is in 2009 that this conversation is happening, this internal conversation. This is when Google had first purchased YouTube, because people don't even understand. From 2005 through 2009, there was no money to be made on YouTube. YouTube was losing money by the day. They were losing a lot of money. And that's why Google bought the company, because the money that they had to pay for the bandwidth, they had no way to pay for it, because there were no ads on YouTube until 2009. That's when I signed up for what then was called the partner program. It's still called that, 
But back then, you actually had to apply to become a YouTube partner. You had to apply, and they had to approve you to put ads on your videos, if y'all can imagine that. Nowadays, they just put them on. Everybody gets an ad. You get an ad. I get an ad. (laughs) Back then, you had to ask YouTube to put ads on your videos. That's It's just crazy to think of. It wasn't even 10 years ago that that happened. But that's when I got into the partner program. I remember my first check from YouTube was for was actually technically from Google. It was for like $10. And I was excited because <laughs> I'm like, man, all I did was go to the gym and work out. And I just made money doing it. Like I can keep doing this. Then 2010 is when I sold my first actual product. It was a basketball training program like for a player to take and work on their game by themselves. In 2010, that was hoop hand book, which I still do to this very day. And to answer your other question, to come to the mental toughness, confidence, and discipline, it was still through basketball. I was posting these videos every day, and players would ask me questions in the comments. They started to get to know me. Okay, who are you? Where are you from? Where would you play in high school? You know, are you going to the NBA? And I would tell them my story. Like, I barely played in high school, didn't do too great in college, had to call and scrape my way to get into the pros. And people would ask me, well, Dre, if you've had so- all these hardships, like you barely played in high school, they would say, well, I'm, I'm in high school and I'm barely playing. Oh, you played a Division three college. I'm in college and I'm not playing at all. Or I'm at a Division three college. And I'm, I know this is not going to get me to the pros just from doing this. Or you, or you called and scraped your way to get to the pros. Well, I'm out of college and I want to get to the pros. And I'm calling and scraping and I'm not there yet. So, Dre, how do you stay mentally on point how do you stay how do you stay so focused dre to come to the gym every day and work on your game even though you've had all these disappointments and setbacks and you have no idea where your next check is coming from in basketball how do you do that so i started making these weekly motivation videos where i would just share some some mindset tip or idea that i had that kept me going week after week and i still do the weekly motivation we're over 330 weeks into it haven't missed a single monday for seven years. But that's how the, the mental toughness, the confidence, the discipline, because those are the things people would ask me about, because it takes discipline to show up and do any job every single day, especially when you're not getting paid for it. It takes mental toughness to keep pushing for a job that is literally, when people say being a professional athlete is one in a million, it is literally one in a million to keep pushing for that when you have no idea that it's going to work. And of course, players ask about confidence. How do you get confident enough to talk to a girl? How do you get mm-hmm. To confident enough to play professional basketball. How do you keep your confidence up when you talk to the girl and she wasn't interested? How do you keep your confidence up when you played in the game and you got your, your butt kicked all up and down the court? How do you show up the next day with your head high? So those three topics, it was they were it was a natural progression, the type of stuff people were asking me about because they could just tell by the way I communicated and the things I was doing, like this guy has to have some answers on this topic. And that's how that became my my niche the, my niche topic mental toughness confidence and discipline and that's all called work on your game so one of the things i'm hearing from what you're saying is that you were basically um adjusting to what you're not adjusting but you were listening to what your audience wanted and delivering on what they already kind of expected of you right so is that a tip that you would have for someone out here who's trying to figure out so what should i focus on what should be the thing that i create content or maybe you can speak to really listening to the audience and then figuring out how to create something that they will uh interact with and engage with there's a simple question that i would tell everyone here to ask themselves you go look in the mirror in your bathroom in your car wherever you got a mirror on your phone and ask yourself what am i doing and where am i at when i am at my highest level of value where am i delivering the most value in my life is it when you're standing in front of a room and speaking is it when you are supporting the team working is it when you are leading a group doing something is it when you're on a computer typing is it when you're in the gym working out when it what is it when you're at your job is it amongst your family what are you doing when you're getting the highest level of engagement from the people who are around you where do you feel the most energy where are you where do you show up and people's eyes light up and the room the energy in the room just shoots up just because you walked into the room and where when you walk into the room or even when you walk out of the room nobody even notices that you came and nobody notices that you left what happens to a lot of people rain is that they spend so much of their time in that second place where nobody even notices that you're you're there nobody notices that you left when and they're shunning they're turning it back on the place where they're getting the most energy providing the most value probably will make the most money getting the most attention and actually making a difference in the most lives if you just ask yourself those questions the answer is going to be obvious it's going to come up the same thing or the couple same couple things over and over and over again 
All people had to do was ask the, themselves that question with a positive expectancy of getting an answer. You know, it's funny that you said that. I actually did a podcast episode about embracing the positive patterns in your life because a lot of times, as you said, there are things, there are themes that keep showing up in our lives and we don't want to embrace them. But when you do, you realize the answer was probably there all along. And I even liken that in my own life with interviewing, right? I kept thinking, what should I really focus on? But I had always been interviewing people from like my college days. Days, but I hadn't thought about doing a podcast until, you know, late 2015. So it's just so interesting how sometimes the answers can be right in front of you, but you're not really um, committing to listening and to embracing them. Exactly. And sometimes we, it comes so naturally to us that we don't even think of it as the thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that's something I do on the side. <laughs> exactly. So once they figure out, once they answer the, those questions that you pose, then, then what? Well, once you get that answer, then what you need to do is start providing value to people. You need to start providing value in the way that you do that to separate yourself from everyone else. And this is something that people ask because nowadays, listen, everybody has a podcast. Everyone's on all the social media. There's no right now, at least with what we have, there's no new ground to break as far as being new on a platform because everything, everybody's on it. So how can someone like myself, who I was on a platform way early, how can what can I tell you that you can use today? And is this there's one thing that each one of us has that is a competitive advantage that we will never lose. But if we're not using it, we might as well not even have it. And that is our individuality. That is being ourselves. If someone, anyone who follows me on social media or reads anything that I write or listens to me anywhere, they know that I'm being 100 percent myself all the time. I don't have an on the mic and off the mic persona. I don't have an on camera, off camera in front of these people, in front of these people. I'm the same person every single time. And I'm the same person even when I'm not on a, any type of platform or I don't I don't not even thinking that there's an audience watching me. You have to be who you are as a person. Find your voice find your energy and just be that because what you have to understand is everybody is not going to buy into who you are as a person. And it's not about you getting everyone to like you because as they say, if you're everything, to everybody, you're nobody to know to you're nobody to no one or what, however it is. You know? So you have to get clear on who you are as a person. And then you put that out there. And it's not about you finding an audience first and then putting yourself out there It's about you putting yourself out there. And what happens is the audience will select itself when you put yourself out there, there's going to be a group of people who says, wow, I like what she is saying. I like how she's saying it. I like where she's coming from. I, I feel exactly how she's feeling. I'm in this. This is me right here. I want to hear this woman speak. I want to hear this man speak. And there are going to be other people who say, OK, he's she's cool. He's cool. I'll check in every once in a while. They're, they're kind of in the middle. They're the in and out people who every once in a while, the casual fans. And then you got people who say, OK, that's not for me. It's cool what you're doing, but I'm just not interested in that. And they're going to go the opposite direction. And that's all right. What you need to do, each one of you listening, is be yourself. Somebody's going to join your tribe. They're going to be the first person in your audience. Maybe it's only one person. If it's one person in the crowd, listen, I remember I heard a story 50 Cent was talking about this when he was first coming out and on his mixtape thing before his first album came out. And one of his friends said to him, 50, we're about to go do this local show in this small town. Listen, what if only five people show up to the show, 50? And 50 said, listen, if five people show up to that show, we're going to get those five people the best show they ever got in their lives. And you know what's going to happen the next time we come to this town? Each one of those five people is going to tell two friends. And it's going to be 15 people at the show. And then next time it's going to be 300. And next time it's going to be 5,000. And next time it's going to be 100,000. So you have to give your best show to the people who have raised their hand and said, yes, me. I want to hear what you're talking about. I'm interested in your, your message. So if you're only getting 15 likes on your Instagram posts or 90 views on your YouTube videos, that means you got 15 fans or 90 fans who want to hear what you say next. Don't disrespect that those few fans because there's only a few of them. If you walked into a room for an autograph signing and there were 15 people in the room, would you turn around and cancel it and say, oh, it was only 15 people, so I'm going home? Of course not. You would stay there and you would, you would give those 15 people the, t the best day of their lives. Why? Because they're invested in you. So it's the same thing you had to do with your online audience. Don't compare yourself to anyone else, what anybody else is doing or what their message is. Every one of us has our own path, but you'll never know what your path is or where it leads if you keep neglecting it because you're comparing yourself to someone else or to what you think you're supposed to, quote unquote, be. How did that look like for you, you know, growing your audience in the early days? And what were some of the challenges you faced when doing so? And how did you work through those? Well, for me, it wasn't even so much a growing the audience thing, Raina, because 
there was no such thing as growing an audience in 2006. Mm. It was, you're putting out, I was just putting out videos and people were watching them. I don't even think when I first started on YouTube, there was a such thing as a subscriber. I don't even think you could subscribe to a channel back then. You just looked something up and found it. And it was so few people compared to now that it was easy to find any certain topic because it wasn't so much competition. So it wasn't so much that I was even trying to grow an audience, but I did because going back to what I said a couple minutes ago, I was just being authentic. I was just being who I was. I'm a guy who goes to the gym every single day. I'm a highly motivated, highly determined, super persistent individual. This is what I do. So when people ask me questions, all I did was tell them exactly how I am as a person. There were some people who weren't interested. There were some people who were kind of lukewarm on it. And there were some people who said, man, where have you been my entire life? I've been waiting to hear your voice. And what I want to tell all of you is that doesn't make me any any more special than anyone else who's listening to this there's someone out there waiting to hear your voice right now they can't hear it from oprah they can't hear it from tony robbins they can't hear it from rihanna they can't hear it from beyonce they got to hear it from you they're waiting to hear it from you but until you start speaking they will never hear it i love that until you start speaking they will never hear it and that leads us to the question of what i really want to focus on and we're we're like almost 30 minutes in i didn't even get to ask you this question yet is um why do you think most people let doubt and fear take over? And I'm asking you this because I ask people all the time, what are the biggest challenges to you pursuing your dream? And I want to say like 60% of the answers of our audience is fear and doubt. So maybe you can speak to, you know, why people let that take over and then what we can do to really make sure that fear does not become the thing that's holding us back. Oh, wow. First of all, I got to say you have a very honest audience because most people won't say fear and doubt. They won't admit to it. They'll say, well, I need more information or they'll mm-hmm. say our oh, politics is getting in the way or they'll blame something other than themselves. But that's great that people have at least identified that. That's the first step. But how to not let fear and doubt get in the way? The number one thing you got to do is take action. Fear and doubt. Can't, don't exist when you are taking action or maybe they do but not in as much not in as heavy a dose because you have to put some focus into the action that you're taking the more you think about something the more the fear grows the more you think about something the more you come to doubt it i mean think about this how many times have you been in a room where you knew you had something to share with everyone in that room that you could have said but you started you it was right on the tip of your tongue you were just about to raise your hand your shoulder flinched and everything but then you start thinking about what if i'm wrong mm. Who am I? What, who am I to speak up and say something right now? Or maybe you're walking in a grocery store. You've seen your crush, the guy you're interested in or the girl you're interested in. You are about to say something to him and strike up a conversation. But then you thought, well, what if he has a boyfriend? Uh, what if my breast doesn't smell good? Or I don't know what to say. If they say hi back to me, I don't know how to keep the conversation going. You just thought your way out of the situation. But if you had just taken action on the spot, not only would you have seized the initiative, which is huge. Seizing the initiative puts you in the driver's seat, puts you in control of any situation. You being the person to go first at the same time when you put yourself in that type of situation where you have to figure it out in the moment you know what usually happens us human beings we figure it out when you put yourself in a place where you have to figure it out you will but in your, when you're in a situation where you might figure it out you're trying to figure out how you would figure it out you'll never figure it out because mm. your our brains our complex brains are designed to protect us from fear and danger. So the more we think about something, the more our brains are thinking, okay, this must be a dangerous situation. We need to stay away from this somehow, some way. You will think your way out of action much more than you will act your way into failure. You think your way into failure. Wow. That's deep. You Say that one more time. One more time for us. The last part? Yes. What I said was people think their way into failure much more than they act their way into failure. You don't fail because you are unskilled or you didn't do it the right way. You fail because you never started in the first place. That is so important. And um, something else that a lot of our dream drivers bring up is the whole idea of um, not being confident. And maybe that ties back in with the idea of letting fear take over. But I know that you speak about confidence all the time with the people that you work with. So maybe you can give us your best tips for really um, how to instill confidence and motivate yourself at those times when you just don't have it in you. Absolutely. This is what everyone can do to instill confidence in themselves. And there's a three-step process to just work backwards. Here's the first step. Ask yourself what you want in life. What are the results that you want? 
And I mean this in detail. What kind of car do you want to drive? Where do you want to live? How big is your house? Do you have two kids and a dog? What city are you living in? How much money are you making down to the dollar? Write out every detail of your life. And the easy way to think of this is think of your last 24 hours from the moment you woke up to the moment you went to sleep and change everything that was in that movie that is not ideal. And mm. that means you got to change the person you woke up next to. That means you got to change where you're living and change where, what kind of car you drove to work, where you work at, what kind of work you are doing, what your position is at the job. Write it all out. What does your life look like if everything went perfect? That's the first step. Write that out. Here's the second step. We all know that there is no such thing as getting something for nothing, which means all those things that you want, you're going to have to take some action to get them. So in order for you to get all of those things that you want, the next thing is, what do you need to do? What do you need to do to make $10 million a year? What do you need to do to have that man or that woman as your spouse? What do you need to do if you want to have three kids between now and the next five years? What do you need to do if you want to own your own business instead of working for someone else's business? What are all the things you need to do to make your life look exactly as you said it would in step one? That's the second part. What are you actually willing to give to get that because you cannot get something for nothing. You need to be very realistic with this one. The first one was in dream mode. Now you got to get realistic. What work are you going to do to make those dreams happen? That's step number two. Now here's step number three. This is the step that most people skip. This is a step that many people go through their entire lives not even being aware of. And if they do hear of it, maybe they think it's not for them. They don't do this step. Therefore, what they do never equates to what they want to have. And this is it. Here's the question you must ask yourself. Who do I need to be to make all of this come true. Who do I need to be? And what does that, what that means is the being who we are as people, ladies and gentlemen, is all based on how we think. Earl Nightingale said this in the strangest secret. You become what you think about. Napoleon Hill said it in think and grow rich. Tony Robbins says it all the time. Every motivational speaker you heard of has said it. What you think about is exactly who you become. So the question you must ask yourself is what type of person do I need to be? What type of leader do I need to be? How do how do people perceive me when I walk into a room? What is somebody's perception of who I am and how I feel about myself? if They walk past me in aisle five in the grocery store and don't even talk to me. How do people what do people see when they look at me and what do I see when I look at myself? Now, let me explain to you how this works. Once you've written all that stuff out is that it works in actually the reverse order, meaning You must become the person first before you take any action in order to get the result. And this is why many people come up short in life and they don't even know why, because they did all the right things. You ever heard of anybody who did all the right things? They got they went to all the right schools. They read all the right books. They got Mm -hmm. got trainers. They did everything. They listened to every episode of this podcast. They did everything right, took notes. But for some reason, they still didn't get the result. You know why? Because they skipped that third step. Who do I need to be? And in life is actually the first step. So first, you must become the right person. When you become the right person, the actions that you take will result in you getting those things that you want to have. But if you skip the part about who I need to be and you go straight to the part that most human beings spend their entire lives in, I guarantee you 99 percent of the population of this planet right now, all they're thinking about is what I need to do. Everybody has a to do list. Everybody got the, all the different apps. You got a calendar. All these things I need to do. I did this. I did this. I did this. I feel so productive. I'm always working hard. I'm hustling. I'm in the grind. No sleep mode. Team, no sleep. Everybody's all in this doing, 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 doing. How many people are thinking about the being? It was, I don't know who said the statement, but there was someone said, if I had two hours to chop down a tree, I spend the first hour sharpening the salt, right? You've heard that phrase? Yes, I've yeah. heard that is the being part, right? That's the exact thing. If I got two hours to do everything I need to do to get what I want in life, I'm going to spend one hour focusing on who I need to be first. Then I'm going to spend the last whatever time is left focusing on doing what I need to do. Because if you have not become the right person yet, people, nothing you do is going to lead to the result that you want. And if people can just get that through their minds, that can change their lives. So could you talk can you talk us through how this worked in your life? Because I know a lot of us are kind of like, we need examples. So talk to us how this this could actually happen or how this actually works on the individual level. Absolutely. I was, I was reading a book recently by this guy named Alan Weiss. It's called The Million Dollar Consultant. And one of the things that he talked about, just as a, a raw example, and then I'll tell you my personal example, is he was just getting fired from a job and he wanted to become an independent consultant and he wanted to consult really high-end clients. In other words, people who spent a lot of money so he could become a millionaire. And he told his wife, listen, I'm going to start my own business. And his wife said, I support you, honey. You can start your own business. He said, okay, well, there's two conditions. She said, what is that? 
Condition one is that I had to buy some really expensive business suits. And condition two is that everywhere I go, I will only fly in first class airline seats and I will show up everywhere I show up in a a black car, like a limousine, no Ubers, no taxis. And she said, well, we don't have much money, honey. Why do you need to do those things? And he said, because if I'm going to attract these high end clients, I need to start carrying myself as a high end person. That what you need to understand from that is that he didn't say I need to go get 100 leads. He didn't say I need to go hire me a virtual assistant. He didn't say I need to go rent some office space. He said I got to become the person first before I start doing, and that's how I get the result. And he wrote a book called Million Dollar Consulting. So that's to tell you what his result ended up being. Now, as far as me, how you could actually use that, that example, that, that exercise I just gave everybody, is that once you have that written out, Every single day, you're going to look yourself in the mirror and you're going to read that out loud to yourself for 10 minutes, five minutes, however long it takes. Mm -hmm. It's going to feel silly at first. You're going to feel stupid. You're going to read it and you're going to be like, this is completely unrealistic. This is a thousand times how much money I make right now. Look where I'm living right now and the type of place I'm talking about here. This is dumb. Most people say that and they don't do it and therefore they don't get what they want. What I started doing is I did that exercise. So that's not just some, that's not some abstract example. I did that exercise. I wrote it down. What type of person do I need to be? What do I need to do? Who am I going to become? And in my life right now, all of those things are starting to take place. They haven't all happened yet, but they have they have changed. Things have changed about what type of business that I'm running, how people perceive me when they see me, how people perceive me when they read about me, how people perceive me when they hear my voice. All of these things start to change. The people who I was around changed. The material possessions of mine changed. Where I live changed. All of those things started to change because consistently I was telling myself not only what I wanted to have and what I needed to do, because everybody talks about that, what we want and what we're doing, but I changed who I was being because I gave it to my, what this is, is all conditioning for your subconscious mind. Give any message to your subconscious mind often enough, the subconscious mind will go to work on it. And if you think this is not true, just ask yourself, what are your habitual thoughts? Do you always think about, I don't have enough money? Do you always think about, I don't know how I'm going to make this work? Do you always think about fear and stress? Or do you know anybody who always gets mad? No matter what happens, they always find a way to get mad. (laughs) Yeah. Why are you so mad? (laughs) (laughs) It's subconscious conditioning. That's all it is. You tell yourself anything often enough, your subconscious mind will accept it. And understand the subconscious mind has nothing to do with your active thoughts that you can notice. These are things that are happening in your life without you even thinking about it. It is automatic. So how you look. How you walk, how you talk, those are all programmed into your subconscious mind. And the great news is they can be unprogrammed, but you must take control of it to unprogram it. It will not happen on its own. If you do nothing, you will remain exactly as you are. You know what um, that made me think about is um, I think sometimes as creatives, people who are have caring and nurturing spirits in us, sometimes we want to – like I, you can't make somebody – want to take that step you know what I mean you can think about your circle the people that you are carrying yourself with people that you are in relationships with like if that person that you're around all the time does not want to take that step you you can't make them and if you don't want to personally commit to taking that step you can't expect to see any change as you said and I think that's something that we have to come to realize is this is going to be um active action that you have to take for yourself and no one can tell you to do it no one can make you do it it will only come if you want it to happen you know and you how how bad do you really want that change in your life is something else you got to ask yourself absolutely I agree. So one of the things that I also wanted to ask you, and there's so many things here, I just feel like I I have a, you should see my notes right now. They're just all over the place, is the idea of um, working through low points. Because um, I was an athlete, so in, in high school, I ran track, and um, oh. I was what you'd want to say, like I was... I was the person who would always win awards, but the award that I would win would be like team player or, you know, the spirit yeah. award. I never actually won any like, you know, fastest or, or at all the meets. I never won any of anything, but I just love the game so much. And I kept going even when, you know, I wasn't winning, so to say. Can you mm-hmm. talk to us about a time when you weren't winning, but you did not allow that to, uh, to stop your game man i, I gotta only pick one one time that yeah, i wasn't because you know we could be here all night dre <laughs> yeah, i can tell you many i'll tell you when i got out of college actually i'll tell you when i was in college okay. i got recruited to go to a, a ncaa division three school after my freshman year 
So I would go to this new school as a sophomore, this coach who recruited me. After that year, my sophomore year, that coach who recruited me got fired. So a new coach comes, comes in to replace him my junior year. Me and this coach butted heads a lot. In the middle of the season, he kicks me off the basketball team. Now, I remember the very day he kicked me out of the gym in the middle of practice where I knew my college career was over. And as I'm walking out of that gym, I'm thinking to myself, all these guys behind me who are still on the basketball team, I'm better than all of them. I knew I was better than all of them. But at that time, mind you, I'm a junior, so I still got a year and a half of going to school here because I wasn't going to transfer. I didn't have a scholarship, so I I couldn't transfer. I'm thinking to myself, but at this moment, any logical, reasonable person could look at the situation and say, well, Dre, maybe you have more skill than them. But look, they're on the basketball team at your school and you're not. So I knew that for posterity's sake, the only way I could prove to myself to be better than all of those guys and to prove my coach wrong for kicking me out was that I had to make it to the pros. And mind you, this is in January 2003 that happened. Mm-hmm. It was almost three years before I got my first professional contract. And I had to use that situation as a, and I was, I mean, my whole senior year, people are looking at me, I'm coming to the basketball games because one of my best friends was still on the team. I'm coming to the game sitting in the front row. People are looking at me like, yo, why are you not on the basketball team? What happened? Why are you not in practice anymore? And people are looking at me like, okay, basketball is pretty much over for you. What's going to happen? What are you going to do next? What are you going to do when you graduate? I remember graduating from college, coming home to Philadelphia to my parents' house. My mother asking me, what are you going to do next? I said, I'm going to play professional basketball. And I got to paint a picture for everybody to understand that my mother's an educator. She's a teacher and, and tutor, has tutored students as long as I can remember. She's big on education, getting your degree. That's what she was all about for my sister and for myself. And me being the youngest, once I graduated, she felt like she had achieved her goal, got both of her kids to finish college. So when I said I want to be a professional basketball player, you got to understand, this is her son who didn't start playing basketball until he was 14. Her son who came home at 12 years old crying because I tried out for a basketball team and didn't make it, while all the other kids whose parents she knew, she was cool with all the moms, their kids made it, but I didn't make it. This is her son who didn't even play in high school. The one game that she came to in high school, the one year I was on the team, I didn't even get in the game. This is her son who didn't even play his last year and a half in college. He's 22 years old with a college degree, moving back into his parents' house, talking about he's going to play professional basketball. It logically made no sense whatsoever. And she let me know that verbally more than, more than once, that, she did, that it didn't make any sense. And what really drove me about that conversation was not that she was wrong. I had no proof, no evidence, nothing to point to that could say she was wrong and I was right. It was that I knew there was nothing I could say. I knew there was no, nothing I could put on paper that said, okay, this is why it makes sense. Absolutely nothing. And I used that. Plus the coach kicking me off the team. Those those times, you and you got to understand. People got to understand that I graduated from college in May of 2004. I didn't start my playing career until September of 2005. So for a year, I was working regular jobs. Basketball pretty much seemed over. Anyone who looked at me said, "Okay, well, you graduated from college. Cool, you got your degree. You're working a regular job. That's pretty much what it's going to be." I had to use all that as my motivation to push me forward. And when I finally got my chance to get on, I used those stories to let other kids who are in my situation, not playing on the team, not getting in the game, not even on the team, period, have family who don't believe in them, maybe even actively discourage them, let them know, listen, here's somebody who went through all of that and still made it through. And there's an audience, as I mentioned a while ago, there's an audience of people who need to hear that. So anything that you've been through, whether it was positive or negative, there's an audience of people who need to hear it because they're thinking it's time for me to give up. Like we talked about earlier at the top of the show, it might be time for me to give up because this obviously isn't going to work. Who's been through this? Nobody except me. Oh, but wait, you've been through it, but you're not talking about it. You haven't told anybody. You haven't told your story. You haven't shared your story. So there's somebody out there on this planet feeling like they're all alone in the world because people who have the story, who have the experience, who've been through it and made it through for whatever reason, you're being selfish and not sharing your story. So you owe that to people to tell them what you've been through. And I think um, it's funny because on episode 66 uh, with Nia Phillip, we talked about how our stories have power, right? Not only for those that are hearing it, but before ourselves. And we don't realize that sometimes by sharing our story and letting it out, it's going to reveal something greater than we could ever imagine. You know what I mean? By you putting your story out there, by doing those uh, those those videos in the gym and just talking about what happened to you, you you set yourself or you you push 
pushed the domino that then, you know, you know how the domino effect, like it yep. happened. And, and I feel like some of us are just so scared and it goes back to that whole idea of fear. You never know if you never try. So um, I just want to say to people listening in, don't let uh, that fear take over because there's so many blessings that could be waiting for you around the corner. But Dre, let's let's wind down a little bit. Um, talk to us about what your day to day looks like now and what's next for you and the stuff that you're working on. Well, my day to day now, I start off with some yoga. Well, I do my that be reading out who you need to be, do and have. I do that every single day. That's the first thing I do when I wake up. Then I'm doing some yoga. I go to the gym where I live. There's a pool. I live in Miami, so we can use the pool in the winter time. So I go use the pool a little bit, and then I'm working. I usually spend maybe an hour to anywhere from one to three hours reading, and then I'm either on the phone making calls because I do professional speaking. I'm creating products. I'm making sales pages. I'm replying to emails. I'm making sure products are getting sent out properly, recording new videos, recording new podcast episodes. I do a podcast myself, blogging, writing articles on LinkedIn. I'm just creating. That's what I do. I create content. I create products. And I want to take everything that I've been through, everything I know, and put it into a format where people who come years after me can catch it the same way i found Napoleon Hill who wrote his book in 1938 and I could read it as if it just came out today. I want people to find me a hundred years from now and say, man, this dude, this dude knew what he was talking about. That book changed my life. Like, honestly, I read that after graduating from college and it literally was the first book that made me realize that I need to get out here and start, you know, pursuing and listening to my, my, my calling. I would recommend anyone who, um, it's having doubt or who just needs some clarity on what's next in your life. Read, think and grow rich. That is a great book. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I give him one more about Napoleon Hill? Mm-hmm. It's called, what is it called? It's called outwitting the devil. I've it's never an- heard of that one. I got to write that. Down. Never heard of that book. Raina, you got to get that book. And here's what I'm going to tell everybody who's never heard of that book. The day you open it and start reading it, you're going to read the whole book in one sitting. one sitting. It's not because it's so short. Is because it is so gripping. The book just pulls you along. It's like a really good movie, but it's a book. And the whole book is about how the quote unquote the devil gets people out of their success in life. And I'm not even going to try to give the book away, but I tell everybody go look that book up. And the backstory to that book is that Napoleon Hill wrote that book around the same period where he wrote Think and Grow Rich. The problem was. He didn't want to put the book out because he in this book, he is critical of religion. He's critical of the education system. He's critical of some really deeply held beliefs that people had at that time. And he felt if he had released that book, that people would have came for him and tore him to shreds. So he never released the manuscript. It wasn't until the year 2011. Yes. Six years ago that this book was actually released by his family, by his heirs. They finally released it because they finally felt it was safe to put this book out. So if that doesn't get you to go find that book, I don't know what will. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna definitely. I have Amazon Prime. Now do my uh, two day yeah. delivery. <laughs> yeah. Get it, get that book. So what keeps you motivated, Dre, when you feel like giving up? Man, it's been a while since I felt like giving up. But what keeps me motivated on a daily basis is that nowadays that I know there's an audience of people out there saying to themselves, you know what, they're waking up and saying they don't feel like it. They're waking up and saying, I don't feel like shooting another 100 jump shots today. They're looking in the mirror and saying, I'm not on the basketball team. Why do I keep working out? They're saying, I have no idea how I'm going to get my name out here in this in this social media space with so many competitors. But then you know what? This light bulb comes on in their heads. And they say, oh, you know what? Dre said such and such in a motivation video five weeks ago. Oh, you know what? I know Dre's going to be up posting that snap every morning. I post this snap on Snapchat of the skyline because I wake up before the sun comes up. They say, I know Dre's going to be posting that snap this morning. Or maybe it's someone here who's never even heard of me, but they hear this episode and they say, you know what? What that guy said on that episode really has me going. My thoughts personally for me, I know that those people are out there. So I know that I can't come on this podcast and say the things that I've said and then not wake up tomorrow morning before the sun comes up. I know I can't say that and then not 
Doug over on the things that I said I'm going to do. I can't look at the, the cold calls that I need to make tomorrow and say, I just don't feel like making these calls because the things that I've already put out there, I've inspired other people to push themselves further. So there's no way that I cannot push myself. I got to live out the message that I put out there. So kind of this content and all the stuff that I put out there is not only motivation for other people, but I'm motivating myself because I have to live up to my words. Because if I'm not living up to what I'm saying, then nothing I'm saying is worth anything. Mm, I think that's a good way to head into our lightning round, Dre. Thank you so much. So at this point of our interview, I want you to tell me the first word that comes to mind. Um, and remember, we're sticking with our whole dreams and drive metaphor, okay? All right. Okay. The first word is park. Park? I think Jose Marti Park. That's a gym that I can see out my window right now. Uh, I, I was supposed to say the first word. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. That's my <laughs> word, phrase, whatever. Um, right. Reverse. Reverse. I think reverse slam dunk. Um, neutral. <laughs> neutral is neutral is actually a what's the what is it oxymoron because there's no such thing as neutral in the universe. You're either getting better or you're getting worse every day. And last but not least, drive. Drive means put your foot on the gas, keep your foot on the gas, sit in the driver's seat, and put your hands on the steering wheel. Get out of the passenger seat, get out of the back seat, get out of the trunk. Um, if you want to be a dream driver, you have to have your keys to success. So, Dre, tell us three things that you think every dream driver needs in their toolkit before they hit the road. Number one thing people need in their toolkit is you must be disciplined. You must discipline yourself to show up and do the work day after day after day. This is not the lottery. It's not going to happen overnight. This is not a, a three-hour movie where you start out at the bottom and, and two hours later you're just a super success and the whole world knows you. You show up every single day, no fanfare, do the work, no complaining, no whining, no belly aching, no impatience with it. You got to keep doing the work. Number two, you must be confident. You must be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, I am the person to lead this group. I'm the person to make this sale. I'm the person everyone needs to listen to. I am the right type of person. There's nothing wrong with me just because someone didn't take my call yesterday or because my ex-boyfriend or girlfriend didn't want to be with me anymore. It doesn't mean I need to fix anything within myself. I am enough. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me, like Stuart Small used to say on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Third thing is you must be mentally tough. You got to be mentally tough enough to understand that that discipline of doing the work every day is building itself into your success. You got to be mentally tough enough to understand when someone tells you that you're too confident, that they think you think you're better than, better than everybody or you're cocky, or you're arrogant. It's not because you actually are. It's just because you're doing something. You have become someone that that person who's criticizing you never could become. So when they look at you, they just can't understand it. And that's where criticism comes from. When people see things that they cannot understand or something that they do understand. But for whatever reason, they've chosen not to do it. They've chosen not to become that person. So in order to feel better about themselves, because because no one's going to look in the mirror and say, wow, Raina just got so confident. I'm not willing to do the work to be that confident. So you know what? I'm just a bum. No, they're not going to do that. They're going to say, no, you're cocky. You're arrogant. You think you're better than everybody else. Why don't you come back down here with us where you belong? You got to be mentally tough enough. This is the third thing to understand this is going to happen. The better you get, you're going to offend some people just by getting better. You're going to offend some people by being disciplined. You are going to offend some people by being confident. And this is part of the game. This is the game that you're in. Understand that when you get into a boxing match, somebody's going to punch you in the face, but it's not personal. It's part of the game. So take the punches as they come. Give the punches as you need to and keep playing the game. Thank you, Dre. Can you tell our dream drivers where they can find you online? Yeah, I'll give you three places. My Snapchat and Instagram is both at Dre Baldwin. First name, last name at Dre Baldwin. My Twitter is at Dre all day. And I have a podcast myself. It is called Work on your game with Dre all day. I love listening to your episodes. I feel like they're to the point. They're on uh, useful topics and you just are so motivational. So I tell everyone go and subscribe to Dre's podcast. You're on iTunes, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Subscribe to it. SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, everywhere. Yep. Promoting other fellow podcasters, so please do so. <laughs> Absolutely, I appreciate it. All right, Jay. Well, I want to say thank you so much, and this has just been so um, so inspiring, even for me as someone who is putting my dreams in drive every day. I think sometimes we need to have that uh, affirmation that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. I think this podcast really helped me solidify that I need to just keep on going on this road. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you for having me, Raina. 
All right, so that's a wrap for episode 72 with Dre Baldwin. I hope that you guys enjoyed hearing him share his dream driving story as well as his keys to success. This episode was so... Um enlightening to me as an interviewer because I think the questions that Dre had us ask ourselves are ones that are so pertinent to our success and so pertinent and so important to us being better as individuals and really working on ourselves and working on the game that is our life. So if there's Anything that you do, I would encourage you all to go to dreamsanddrive.com and click on episode 72 and download our show notes. So I actually made a PDF of the questions and the quotables from today's episode because I just think they're really, really useful and it's something that we need to see daily. So I would recommend you to go get it download it, print it out, save it on your phone, screenshot it. And when you have those moments where you're feeling like, oh my gosh, um, I need some encouragement. I need to, to, to push past this moment that I'm feeling right now. Just look at those quotes and they, they will be able to help you. And you can get them by going to dreamsanddrive.com slash free. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash free. Once again, if you haven't followed us on social, I encourage you to do so. We're at Dreams and Drive, and you can use the hashtag Dreams and Drive across the board. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Find us. We're there. I appreciate you all. I hope that you also can subscribe to our channel wherever you're listening whether it be itunes soundcloud stitcher google play hit subscribe and make sure that you are notified every week when we have a new episode this has been a journey i was just saying that i can't believe we're 72 episodes in 72 for all the people who have been listening since episode one that's amazing, right? That is amazing. Consistency is key. Keep dreaming. Keep driving, dream drivers. I believe in you. And the next few episodes, I'm going to give you guys a little sneak peek, but we're doing a series called Driver's Ed. And we're going to be focusing in on very specific topics. And the first topic is going to be how to get press for your brand. So if you want to know that and you want to hear expert share advice, make sure that you're tuned in for episode 73. We'll chat soon. Bye guys.